Recording. We're recording, folks. Hello, world. Welcome back. <laughs> For anyone who's just tuning in, I'm Christina, and I have my lovely friend Andy Orbarski with us today. Uh, we have both been camera systems in New York City, and we believe that one of the first times we met or worked together was on the TV show Elementary. Uh, but since then, Andy's doing awesome things in the world, and I was wondering if we could start off by you telling all the folks at home. Uh, how did you get into this? Like what was your first job on set or what was your first foray into the camera land? Yeah, um, well, I, um, I went to Ithaca College for my undergrad um, and then I worked at a rental house in New York, Hello World Communications for a couple of years. Then I started assisting and my first job um, on set was a camera assistant for this um, Japanese DP that I actually met at Hello World. Um, he had parked his Alexa there and then I took it upon myself to, to learn about it because I didn't get a lot of technical education in my degree. Um, and that was something in working in a rental house I was striving to like learn more about. Um, so yeah, I worked as a camera assistant and started just hustling on the weekdays and when I was not working at the rental house. Um, I tried to take every job that I could, you know, pretty much everything except for a PA. I was camera assistant, I would, you know, work as an electric and a grip on stuff. Um, and then I just sort of built up my like film lexicon and did supplementary I I education that I didn't receive at AF or at, um, at Ithaca. So yeah, and then I just kept building um, contacts through that and then started working on my own stuff. I, I started my production company with my business partner who I met at the rental house. Um, and then we bought some gear and just, I started DPing a lot more and that's where I am today. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of hustle and a lot of bustle uh, starting out as an AC. Yeah. And then I joined the union, I think in 2016, I joined the union just so that I could get experience on bigger sets um, and larger projects. Um, and then we met on elementary. Ooh. And here we are now. <laughs> and here we are now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a, a wild journey since then for me as well. So I know it's, it's kind of curious and exciting to look back to see how much we have gotten to here. And then we'll, yeah. you know, see where Yeah, six years is. feels like, I mean, in the, I've worked for six years in the industry um, and it feels like so little time and so long at the same time. <laughs> Um, one of the beautiful things about cinematography is that you can do it for a very long time if you if you so choose. You know, uh, Stephen Lighthill, ASC is the president, who is now the new president of the ASC, is in his late seventies. You know, and he's still active, and it's something that is a long trajectory of a career. Um, and I think as cinematographers, we're constantly analyzing oh, where am I? How often have I worked? Do I work enough? Where are these other people in my career? And it's like kind of beautiful to realize that it takes a long time to get to where you want to be. And there's always going to be these stars that are shooting upward very quickly, but you know, they're kind of like ducks, like above the water, they seem really, really cool and calm, but like they've worked their ass off to get there. You know? That's a great, <laughs> that's a great reference for sure. Yeah. Well, since you started shooting, would you say that uh, since you, really since you started to where you are now, can you see that you um, have a style in that? Or do you feel like people perceive you in a certain way if they look at your reel and hire you? Yeah, I think, I don't know if I have a certain style. Um, I, I really truly try to find styles that are appropriate for each story. I think style can be defined as, a look or a feeling that is made up of a lot of different techniques that you attempt to utilize from your toolbox to tell stories. And there's, there are definitely things that I keep coming back to that I'm noticing in my work, like certain angles that I'll pick to convey mm. an emotion or a status of a, a status of a character. I don't think I would say that I have a style though. Um, I think people look at my reel and they think I have a lot of colors uh, involves. Um, I am by no means Vittorio Serraro, um, but I, yeah, I guess colorful and energetic, but again, I try to make everything for each 
project, each project. Yeah. Work because each story is different and it has to be approached in a totally different way. Uh, for those who don't know, can you speak about your AFI experience and maybe where that is shaping you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I am currently a rising uh, second year fellow, cinematography fellow at AFI. Um, it's always been in the back of my mind, grad school. Um, but it, it didn't make sense until a few years ago when I felt I was, I was hustling. I was doing a bunch of short films. I'd shot my first feature when I was 24. And then I just kind of plateaued in where I was going. And I didn't know how to, to move past that. I felt like I was doing the same thing over and over and over again. And so um, AFI has one of, if not the top cinematography, I mean, the only place you can get a cinematography MFA that I'm aware of. Um, and I've known a lot of great DPs to come out of there. Um, so I was like, what the hell, I'll apply. Um, and I've definitely grown a lot in my first year. I've learned a lot. Um, Namely, the most important thing is how everything is tied to story. And I've learned how to communicate in regards to that. And I've learned how to collaborate with a lot of different personalities that I don't think I would have been able to do before. <laughs> like AFI is a really great uh, exercise in networking. <laughs> I will say that as well, um, which is something that I've always not been the most keen on um, and has definitely opened up and flexed my muscles in regards to how to talk to personalities, which is vital as a cinematographer. Totally. I mean, that's been the, honestly really educational and exciting for me mm -hmm. uh, in a really nerdy way <laughs> to talk mm -hmm. to other either cinematographers or like people along the way, because it is such a collaborative medium. Yeah. And I think the word networking and communication aren't inherently like fun. No. <laughs> <Fuck it up. laughs> but when you see people uh, share tools or share experiences that help bridge that and help kind of demystify that. It's exciting because then you're like, oh, it's just like, like having a, it's as if we were having this conversation at a bar right now. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I that wish feels, I was at a bar right now. I know. <laughs> um, but actually, speaking of AFI, uh, would you say there are certain AFI alums that you've already been able to connect with or even before? Um, yeah, I've, I mean, I've been, a, I've spoken to a number of AFI alums and it's kind of like a, if you go through boot camp, like if you go through a really tough experience, it's a little bit of a calling card to be able to say like, hey, I did that too. You know, it's, I, it, my first year at AFI was the busiest I've ever been in my entire life. And I generally try to keep myself very, very occupied even in my downtime. So, um, I mean, I've had the opportunity to, to talk to a number of AFI alums um, in both intimate and non-intimate. Again, this is the the benefit of COVID um, and that, you know, I've listened to Maddie Liebetik a number of times, Rachel Morrison. Um, we had uh, Holly Morgan come and teach one of our classes. It's, it's super fascinating. She just shot Lucy um, with uh, Natalie Portman last year. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's something that's really nice about being able to say that you've gone through the shit and you've gone through that program because everyone, it's structured in such a way that's like, everyone knows what you've done, even if the, the processes change from year yeah. to year. Um, and it's just like a grueling few years, <laughs> so. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's inspiring. I remember, I, gosh, it feels like, a month ago when we were like sitting for coffee or something yeah. and you're talking about you going. Yeah. You were so. telling me about your friend. You have to give me his name again. To yeah. Check him, check him out. But um, yeah, yeah but I did, I did a lot of research in preparing to come there to make sure that that was like the right move. And I definitely, I feel like I've grown both as an individual and as an artist. Um, so, That's yeah. awesome. Well, again, to go into the collaborative nature of all this, Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to some of the collaborations you've had with uh, specific directors in your career so far? Yeah, how, um, yeah. the longest lasting one I've definitely had is with my best friend, uh, Nate, uh, Nathan Breton. We went to a 
Uh, yeah, it's it's acting a little funny, but maybe you'll figure it out. Technical difficulties. Stand by, folks. Let's see. Connection. Oh, that sounds better. Is it? Yeah. Okay, great. I just lost you for a little bit. So That's you're, you're mentioning uh, your uh, friend Nathan. Right, right, right. So we weren't we weren't really tight in college, but we had um, we both graduated the same year. Common, um, and he was working at the time for an advertising agency, um, which is now noticing. Um, and he brought me onto a lot of the projects. We started. Uh, we were also roommates, so, um, and then we just started collaborating. He just he's a director. He's a fantastic director. Um, over the weekend for like 17 hour days and just make a bunch of shorts um, and those started to get picked up and our relationship has just grown um, and I think the strength of our collaboration is one of the most important stages of of um, cinematography and I think you find a lot of your connection with your collaborators communication and pre-production then you're kind of fucked on the day um, because it's all about being able to communicate abstract ideas in an effective way so that when it comes time to actually execute them you're like that's what I meant or so yeah. Well, you know, another, or like a deepening of that question, I guess, would be uh, how you, I, I just think there's something so exciting about that translation in your head between that, maybe that visual reference and making it happen in real life. And maybe you can speak to how you have to do that, you know, whether it's like showing the still photographer's photo or showing the still of a movie and like explaining to a director, like, hey, this <laughs> yeah 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 well it's a you know it's a combination of things like i when i'm working when i'm preparing for a project i just kind of try to inundate myself in the world of the character and what's going on and what the director wants to convey um like right now for my thesis we're watching a ton of different movies from all kinds of genres to understand what this love story is love is such a giant theme and we're trying to nail down this tone which it's like it just feels like you're swimming in this huge pool of resources and you have to narrow down what you yeah. want um so yeah i don't know i look at um i look at a lot of other movies i look at a lot of film photography um or still photography rather um and anything from you know classical art or, you know, it, it's also about defining with each image the specificity of what you mean because lookbooks can be all over the place and it's like, throw anything that sticks, you know? <laughs> but you as a cinematographer and a positive collaborator need to be able to say, I like this image because it makes me feel this because of this, this, and this, the colors, the intensity, the line, whatever you want to look at and be able to say, I want to use this at certain points. Now for me, when I'm reading a script, like when I'm presented with a script, I read it once just to get the idea, understand the plot, I read it again, to then start jotting down ideas. And from there, I'm able to go forth and say, I see this, I don't see this. Mm -hmm. What do you see, you know? Well, that's something, again, I've been excited. I keep saying excited, so excited. Are you really that excited? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> On the edge of your seat. <laughs> I'm literally on the edge of my seat. No, I just I think that's those those moments when when you're in person with someone or you get to work on a project with someone, it's it's compelling to drive that forward and to keep totally your relationship. But uh, to me, my like big buzzword is inspiration because uh, as creatives, whether we were living in a world pre or post COVID, you know, mm -hmm. we're all just trying to stay sane and stay inspired. And I was just wondering if you could talk about how maybe before COVID, how in the midst of everything you stayed inspired versus kind of how you're staying inspired now. Sure, sure.
I write a lot. I definitely I I I write in my journal a lot, and it's something that I've I've been doing more recently because I have the time. But it's also just um, interesting. I recently reread my journals from high school onward, um, and there's been definitely an exponential increase in how often I write post high school. But um, I write a lot. I try to read as much as I can. And not necessarily, I'm not, it's a challenge for me to want to read about cinematography. Like I get AC Magazine and it, it takes a lot for me to want to delve into it and I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I try to, I, I, I made this uh, New Year's resolution for myself a couple of years ago, which I've kept up to date with, where I watch one new film a week that I haven't seen. So I just try to like keep my eyes hungry for things and I keep, to, you know, there's, we all have a list that's like, I need to watch this. I need to watch this. So oh, I yeah. never actually go back to it. Um, but yeah, I try to watch one new film a week and then I'll culminate that list at the end of the year that says these were my 2019, 2018, 2017. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, I take a lot of still photography. Like I, I do a lot of 35 and, and medium format photography. Um, which just is for me shooting on film is such a tactile process that makes you really connected with the medium. Yeah. Um, you know, I was for a while I was developing my own black and white um, film, and I have a scanner, so I didn't even have to go to a lab to pay to process it or whatever. That's awesome. Which is nice. Um, yeah, just just flexing those muscles constantly, but not putting pressure on yourself. You know, if you work out too much, then you just get fatigued. So it's you have to be able to be an endurance runner in your own creative stimulation. You know? Yeah, I feel like people won't talk about that. There can be a lot of like inspiration fatigue or creativity fatigue, especially totally. if you're- Well, I mean, yeah, Instagram is both a great and an awful thing. <laughs> you know, like there's some people that are really good at that game and I am not one of those people. <laughs> yeah. I want to get better at that and I've been trying to do that, but it's, it's, it's rough. It's really, really rough, you know? Um, I have to do that and also it doesn't matter your it really doesn't matter your followers but it's 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 hard for me to not think about it numerically in that sense yeah, yeah. Uh, would you say is there something specifically during the quarantine that's kept you sane in a creative way oh i've been riding my bike a lot oh, nice. <laughs> i've like I, i've picked i've had, people people have talked about gaining quarantine weight and I'm actually knock on wood pretty happy that I lost weight because riding a bike is like the most I can put effort into it and I get an immediate reaction to it it's like working you know it's just it's the endorphin boost that you need because you can't as an extrovert you can't go to bars you can't I mean you can you can be a, a fuck boy and go to bars and yeah. run trona and <laughs> terrible yeah. but you can't go out and do all these things that give you the endorphins of working and being around other people. You can't be on set. You can't be creative. You can't collaborate. Yeah. So bike riding for me has honestly just been something that I can clear my mind and just go for two hours and just think and be at peace with my own body. You know, That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of funny to, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm very similar in the sense of trying to watch new things to keep, me like re-inspired but also kind of going back to things that almost like your guilty pleasures or not even guilty pleasures but just those like classic films or classic what tv shows film have you watched that you're like guilty, that you go back to all the time oh i have one asking question ah. <laughs> what <laughs> field do i go back to i have some really bad guilty pleasures so i don't know if i want to release all those online oh I'll tell God, you later. No, dish it <laughs> <laughs> um okay for all those watching, if anyone's still listening, um, I had a really bad phase where I couldn't help it. And I was watching the UK show, Love Island. Oh my God. <laughs> and it's so bad. But it's just, it's funny to me because I, I mean, I grew up with reality TV, but I didn't think too hard about it, right? It's not really meant to think too hard about, but kind of coming back to like after watching things like w there was a week where I was like only watching Scorsese movies. There was like watching all of Catherine Bigelow's films. And then I was like, I need to like slow down the brain. Let me yeah. <laughs> watch some Love Island. Yeah. And I have to say it was so wild because like when you have a certain critical lens in your head on, 
even something stupid, I can't help but like be like, oh, that's kind of cute. How did they do that? Or yeah, like, especially. It's like, yeah, it's like I think musicians are ruined, like ruined <laughs> by going to music theory, like by going to. We're ruined by by <laughs> our industry. Um, yeah. That's not to say that you can't enjoy things, but you do have to kind of be able to turn turn that turn that off in your brain. You know. Well, after a certain amount of time, it's really numbing. Like it's like bad. It's like a really bad. That's like quintessential. But I mean, for you, is there any movies or TV shows that not necessarily guilty ones, but ones that like, I don't know, like another one for me is um, the old like classic MGM musical, Sing in the Rain. Oh, uh, yeah. There's something like so sweet about it. I grew up with. And then if anything, when I watched it, I watched it on my birthday again this year. Oh, cool. And I really was thinking about the light. I like never looked at the light in that movie. And for a kind of, you could say like a light rom-com. Yeah. Um, they were such hard light on them to constantly see so well lit, but then they had shadows. Like I just right. thought it was so funny. It was like such a, like a- well, Yeah, it's a perfect time. It's an epic. It's 1000% an epic. You've got dream sequences, you've got dance sequences, you've got comedy, you've got, you, you know, you've got love, which is very dramatic. And yeah, I, I love it's, that movie. It's a classic, it really is. But I just thought it was so funny to be like, I've always thought this was such a, like a feel good movie. And then I watched it with a critical lens and I was like, oh, the lighting is kind of interesting. Or it's kind of Very fun to dramatic. see, yeah. uh, you know, the difference between obviously like generational lighting techniques versus oh, yeah. um, what's called, what is it? Like uh, more like real life versus dream sequences, you know, sure. with that too. Sure. Um, yeah, well, there's just such an evolution of how we see light and how, I mean, it also has to deal with the sensitivity of the film stocks at the time. But um, yeah, everyone loves soft light now. Everyone just put them near a window, put them near a window, throw curtains on the window and it'll be great. Do the Rembrandt thing. Um, so one thing that I've really enjoyed just to skip around, I'll come back to your question about what my guilty pleasure movie is. It's not even a guilty pleasure, but um, being able to practice with hard light is something that I've been able to do recently, which is just something that I'm going to try and incorporate into any non-commercial, <laughs> um, non-commercial project because our light is all around us. Um, I'm sitting outside right now in my parents' front lawn, and there's just you know hard light coming from everywhere, um, and it's just something that we don't ever really embrace because. It's something that's challenging and you have to be able to know how to shape it. And I think gripology is, you know, I, I was I was listening to Reed Morano talk because she had a number of years back and she'd come up as a key, as a as a grip and she said, you can all anybody can place a light, but if you know how to shape that, then you really have a true arsenal as a cinematographer. Um okay, enough of that. <laughs> Harold and Maude, uh, Hal Ashby's Ooh. Harold and Maude is my go-to. I, I watch it once a year, I would say at least. And it's just something that I am always like moved by, both visually yeah. and editing and just tonally. It's such a weird fucking movie <laughs> and dry, dry humor. Um, yeah, Harold and Maude. And then I always used to watch I Am Sam just because I think it's an amazing cry and Sean Penn does such a good job acting in it. Um, but yeah, those are kind of my two. That's awesome. Would you say there, I mean, I don't know if you have the time or if that's how your brain works, but are there times when you, you look at a cinematographer and it's like, wow, I really admire their work. What have they done? And then like look through some of their stuff. Is oh, there yeah. like certain big Absolutely. key names? For you? Absolutely. Um, Ed Lockman's definitely, <laughs> he's yeah. just so versatile, and so masterful um, in what he can do. Uh, I mean, Carol, um, he had shot this trilogy called the Paradise Trilogy by this Aus Austrian director called named Ulrich Seidel. Um, and it's looking at his work um, with Todd Haynes and with this director, they're just completely different. You know, I I love when a director, and which is probably why I don't think I have like a style because I'm attempting to 
sell myself as versatile um, because stories are versatile and you have to be able to tell all stories because that relates to our ability as humans to be empathetic to all stories. So um, I just I just admire Ed Lockman's versatility in in the multitude. And of course, he's he's quite old and has had the ability to look back on a decades long career and say, I've done this and this and this and this. Um, but I really admire his, his versatility. Um, I've always loved Maddie Lee Batik. Um, his, his style has always been super interesting to me. And I find that I like a lot of his lighting techniques. He doesn't ever really use a light that's true uh, 55 or true 3200. Um, Cause our world doesn't really reflect those two true, <laughs> uh, true color temperatures to us. We're always feeling something that's warmer or cooler than, than just white. I think white, I think white light, I think exists solely in a commercial vacuum a lot of the time. Um, but maybe that's just how I see it. So yeah, I would say Manny Lee Batik. Um, yeah. And Ellen, Ellen Curis. Yeah. Oh, oh, Ellen. You just just listen. If you can listen to Ellen Kira's talk, just like take the opportunity to do so. I know. I was so I was so fortunate. I've either heard her talk in person, or there was some local six hundred event where she was like at and was there, and it was just like, what a national treasure. <laughs> I know, and and she got started late. Like she had, I think, a degree or a degree in documentary um, photography. Um, and she's just, oh, who else did I, I just listened to this one DP talk um, and she's French and she shot the wrestler and I'm going to fuck up oh, her name. Oh, yes. So I got to remember her name. It's, <laughs> you know what? I almost worked with her this year, but I would have been in quarantine anyways. It's like Marja or something. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Oh my God. You have to edit this part out <laughs> <laughs> because I can't believe um, I'm fucking up. No, it's up. Okay name it's tricky Maris alberti oh my god she oh. was amazing i would love to work with her because she has she has done so many docs yeah and, um but not just docs like there's something so inspiring docs. about that yeah. yeah i mean i think her her work is an example that she gets thrown into the doc world visually like the wrestler is one of Darren Aronofsky's films that wasn't shot by Matthew Lee Boutique um and it is shot you know with it's very super 16 it's very gritty it's handheld you're with you're with um Mickey Rourke the entire time um but yeah she was just uh, we listened to her for a class for AFI and she was just a treasure and so inspirational to talk to yeah um yeah I don't know there's not there's not like just one PP that I am sort of like girl crazy for, you know. I know what you mean. I feel like there are days when I'm like, I just want to like stare at their work or like somehow it's like, if you can, what is it like matrix in like upload all this information, like you hear these talks and it just all like soaks yeah. into you. I was in the back of your brain. <laughs> if only. Well, I have to bring up, this is kind of one of my like final questions of the day my favorite elephant in the room question, which is how do you think our lovely film industry is going to look slash feel? I, I hate even saying post COVID because now that I've done this interview series a bit, it doesn't feel like it's going to be post COVID. I don't, I don't think it's going to be like one day it's over, but yeah. I'm just curious how you feel, especially with your experience with AFI and just in general. Yeah. Um, I don't know and I don't have the power to change how it's going to be. So I've definitely set myself into a tailspin trying to think what it's going to be like and trying to compromise with how our lives are going to be different. Um, I think second ACs are going to have a run for their money and are going to have to put up a lot more monitors on set um, because they're gone are the days of 20 people and people standing around a monitor. Um, as if there weren't enough monitors. As if there weren't enough monitors. I <laughs> that life is fucking awful. Yeah, um, that's gonna be my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that there's gonna be a time where we are coming back to how we worked before COVID. I don't know when that's gonna be, but I don't think 
A, I don't think films are going to be able to sustain the workflow that they're projecting, the idea of having separate teams come into a room, then leaving a room. I mean, I think it's going to make projects that are a little bit more infantile, if they follow the rules, really follow block, light, rehearse, shoot, <laughs> which is like a basic concept that anyone who's watching this should just constantly exercise because it makes your life so much easier as a cinematographer. Um, but I don't think that we're going to be making films in hazmat suits. I don't think that's going to be possible. I mean, imagine yourself as an actor and you are looking at a sea of people <laughs> behind the lens who have masks on and, ha and just are completely shielded up. How are you going to do your job? Like, I mean, that's going to be a, a, a huge thing is what SAG is going to allow. You know, we're already seeing implications of our, of our thesis projects and our projects for the next year based on what is going to be possible and allowed via SAG contracts. Um, we had a really interesting talk with Roger Deakins um, and he said, anyone who's written those guidelines, oh, I actually can't say that. Um, I can't say that. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that those guidelines are going to last. Yeah, I don't think they're going to last. Um, and I think we're going to get back to the way it was at one point. Hopefully things will be cleaner. Hopefully people will take more precautions um, on set. But I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to be having such a drastic change in our industry that that it's gonna seem so foreign to us, you know? Um, that's my hope and that's my my thinking. Yeah, we will see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I definitely, it's funny you mentioned it because I definitely have ACs in my life who are like full on team hazmat suit. They're like, you know, if you just yeah. do it, then you're covered all the time. It's not like have mom sometimes, have mom sometimes, wash your hands, then wash your hands, now. like, you know how hard it is just to be a camera assistant wearing gloves in the winter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let alone for an infectious disease. I know, I know. You know what I mean? For anyone that doesn't know at home, it can be very difficult to either change a lens or screw a little screw or there's so many little like fiddly things. Yeah, exactly. It's almost difficult to wear any type of glove. <laughs> Let alone if you're freezing or it's raining or I don't know. So, so many elemental conditions and now we're bringing a, like, you know, apocalyptic condition anyways. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I don't think that it's going to last very long. Um, I don't think productions are going to be able to afford the 20, 15 to 20% increase in time that's going to take to shoot something. Hopefully it opens up more jobs. I will say that hopefully these new um, people are, aren't going to be any less starved for content after this. There's going to be things that are going to explode after this is done. And hopefully that just opens up for shorter days, safer working conditions, and more work opportunities. So that's, that's my hope and that's my, my think about what or thought about what's going to happen post-COVID. Well, I appreciate you and your time so much. So oh, um, thank you. This was a pleasure. Yeah, of course. And if there's anything else you'd like to add or say to the world right now, it's it's hard to imagine what advice anyone can give. I feel like maybe we're inundated with advice, but if there's anything else you'd like to say. I just think there. as a Virgo, <laughs> really important to keep <laughs> routine. Um, keep routine and just try to realize power in that because it, I felt definitely powerless in all of this. Um, and I think it's really important to just realize that you yourself have a lot of power in what you do. And it might sound like you've baked that umpteenth loaf of bread and you're not, if you're not getting satisfaction from what you're doing and the little amount of the tasks that you're doing or hobbies that you're doing, like change it up. You don't have to keep doing it forever. Like just try and realize what makes you happy and active in the capacity that you can do it. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much.
Um, yeah, no problem. I could talk all day, but for those listening at home, maybe I should stop recording. <laughs> Bye. Okay. It was a pleasure. It was a, it was an absolute pleasure. Awesome. I'll talk to you later. Bye.